Let's pray, and we'll dive into our time in the Word today. Father, I thank you so much for um, this church family that I'm so privileged to be able to be a part of. Lord, I thank you for um, the heart that they have to serve, as we have so many volunteers here that help us do all the things that you've called us to do. Lord, I thank you for their heart and love for your Word that makes it just such a privilege and blessing for me to teach them. And Lord, most of all, we thank you for you and your, what you have done and the way that you transform lives. And God, we pray that, that you would do that even today, that for those of us who know you, God, I pray that our hearts would be stirred by you today. For anybody here that doesn't know you, Lord, I pray that they would come to get to know you today, that they would understand today how you have been drawing them to yourself. And so we give you this time now in Jesus' name, amen. I got a question for you. Um, have any of you ever had somebody in your life that you thought, maybe you never vocalized it, but you thought, you know, that's the last person that I would ever imagine getting saved. Or maybe if there was somebody in your life that when they got saved, you were radically surprised. I mean, how many of you can relate you know, to that? Some of you are thinking, I was that person like it was me, you know? Um, well, for me, one such person in my life was a gal by the name of Diana Chavez. And Diana, um, I went to high school with Diana. I went to high school in Santa Ana, and I went to Santa Valley High School. And the school that I went to was, um, had, had, a lo- had several gangs on it. We, every year, we had different people um, in our school that end up uh, getting killed in some kind of gang um, interaction. And Diana Chavez, she was in one of these gangs, and she was about 5'4", and she was the toughest, scariest uh, girl that I had ever met. And every single day, she had two outfits that she wore to school. Um, one outfit was um, Levi cords, black shoes, and a Pendleton. Um, that was one of her outfits. The other one was black shoes, overalls, and a white t-shirt. And if there was ever anybody in, any girl in high school that I thought maybe could beat me up, it was Diana Chavez. And, uh, and I just was like, man, I, I don't want to mess with her. But my senior year of high school, Diana was in my um, economics class, and I show up one day, and she's in a dress. And all the, I called it war paint that they would wear, you know, all the war paint that, that the gang girls would wear, it was gone, and she just looked like a normal, you know, girl, and like her whole demeanor changed, and I was like thinking to myself, what in the world is going on here? And then at lunch, I discovered what was going on, because at lunch, in our senior uh, courtyard, we called it, I come out to the courtyard, and there's about two 200 people gathered around, and Diana Chavez is standing on a table preaching the gospel. And she got radically saved by Jesus. And I remember, yeah, I remember asking her, what happened, Diane? And she said, I got tired of having so many of my friends die in my arms. And it just made this impact upon her life. But you know, I I later thought about this as I thought, you know, I never ever, I was a Christian in high school, and I never ever once shared the gospel with Diane. And part of it was I was just afraid of her, you know. (laughs) But uh, I never once, I thought, man, did I miss out? Did I miss out on an opportunity? Well, today in Acts chapter 9, we are going to see the conversion of a man by the name of Saul of Tarsus, and he will become known as the great apostle Paul, and the conversion of Saul of Tarsus is the most famous famous conversion in all of church history. And we were first introduced to Saul of Tarsus back in chapter 7 when they were stoning the the Lord's servant Stephen and they were killing him by throwing rocks at him. It said that those who were doing that laid their coats at the feet of a young man, a young Pharisee by the name of Saul. 
And then in chapter 8, we read that Saul, it begins by saying, and Saul consenting to the death, being in full agreement of the death of Stephen. And then it launches into chapter 8, we've seen this, this great persecution that Saul of Tarsus was spearheading. And then we come to chapter 9, and the first thing that we read about Saul of Tarsus is Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Saul of Tarsus, enemy number one to the Christian church in that day. And Bible scholars generally agree that aside from the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus ranks as the most significant event in all of church history. Saul, as I said, would become Paul the Apostle. He would write 13 books in the New Testament. That's the impact that this guy had. Now, in the late 1800s in England, there were two well-known scholarly men who decided to put their heads together in an attempt to discredit Christianity and put an end to it. One of those guys, his name was Sir Gilbert Hawkins, and the other man's name was Lord Littleton, and they understood that there were essentially two events that they had to disprove in order to discredit Christianity because it was upon these two, the entire credibility of Christianity hung on these two events. The first event was the resurrection of Jesus Christ because they, they realized that if Jesus really rose again from the dead, then that would prove that he was deity, that he was God in human flesh, and it would validate the necessity of the sacrifice of the cross. But the second event that they wanted to disprove was the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Because the transformed life of Saul of Tarsus proves that Jesus was risen from the dead. So this is what they did. Hawkins undertook the part of the study to prove that the resurrection was a hoax. And Littleton took upon himself to disprove the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. They were so convinced that they were going to be able to disprove these two things that they agreed to not meet together for an entire year and only come back together after a year to celebrate their findings and that they had disproved Christianity. But here's what happened. As Hawkins began to study the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he discovered that the record of the resurrection proved undeniable and credible because the historical, archaeological, and eyewitness evidences were irrefutable. And Littleton set out to disprove the conversion of Saul, and he discovered that the conversion of Saul of Tarsus was the result of a real personal experience with the risen Jesus. And so here's what happens. This is so hilarious. So these two guys, they haven't spoken for a year. They both come together after their year of research. They both had had converted to Christianity, (laughs) but didn't tell the other one. (laughs) Until they met together. How awesome is that, right? It's amazing. The transformation of of Saul of Tarsus into Paul the Apostle is one of the greatest apologetics for the resurrection of Jesus because there's really no explanation for this guy's transformation than the fact that he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And it's interesting Of all the characters in the New Testament, Saul of Tarsus is set apart because in the book of Acts, it records his conversion three times. In Acts 9, in Acts 22, and in Acts 26. And if you know anything about the Bible, when God repeats himself three times, it's to get our attention. So here's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at verses 1 through 19, look at his conversion, and there's four things I want you to know. We're going to look at Saul the hunter, then we'll look at Saul pursued, then we're going to consider Saul surrendered, and then we'll finally look at Saul transformed. Let's begin by looking at Saul the hunter in verses 1 and 2. It says, then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that 
If he found any who were of the way, that means followers of Jesus, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Pause there and give me your attention. Dr. Luke continues to describe Saul in these animal-like terms. He describes him as this man that is panting and huffing and puffing in that phrase, still breathing threats and murder against the Christians. Paul was enraged against Christ. And on his way to Damascus, he has these official papers to tear apart families, to throw Christians in prison. And you know, it's some people like to suggest that Christianity is for weak and simple-minded people. The conversion of Saul of Tarsus blows that myth out of the water because Saul of Tarsus was in no way a weak man, and he definitely wasn't a simple man. Saul was an intellectual force in Israel. Listen to his description of himself recounting his conversion. In Acts 22.3, he describes it this way, that he was educated at the feet of Gamaliel. Now, to say that, that your teacher and instructor was Gamaliel was like saying that you were, uh, were, were tutored by the greatest teacher of all, of all time, at Harvard University. That's how astute this guy and how esteemed this guy Gamaliel was. And Saul of Tarsus was his best student. We're told in Galatians chapter 1, verse 14, Paul describes in his testimony, and I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. He's like, look, I was an all-star student, top tier. I advanced ahead of everyone. And then in Acts 26, verse 4 and 5, he describes it this way. As the Jewish leaders are well aware, I was given a thorough, thorough Jewish training from my earliest childhood among my own people in Jerusalem. Saul of Tarsus was an intellectual giant when it came to the Jewish law. But he was also a driven man. He was a man who was willing to wield all of his religious and political influence for one goal. And his one goal was to exterminate Christianity. I'd like you to keep your place here in chapter 9 and just turn ahead with me to Acts chapter 22. As Paul is sharing in Acts 22 as well as in Acts 26... Um, his conversion experience. I want you to, to read here what he says about himself. Acts 22, find your way to verse 4. Paul says this, I persecuted this way, these followers of Jesus, in other words, notice what it says, to the death. In other words, I had people killed. Binding and delivering into prison both men and women, as also the high priest bears me witness and all the counsel of the elders from whom I also received letters to the brethren and went to Damascus to bring in chains even those who were there in Jerusalem to be punished. Skip down to verse 19. So this is, he's going to talk about the, the Lord speaking to him, meeting with him. So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I imprison and beat those who believe on you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. But he's saying here his, how intense he was. Look at verse 20, chapter uh, 26, verse 10. He says, This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them, and I punished them often in every synagogue, and compelled them, get this, to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. This is what this guy was like. Getting Christians and forcing them. Blasting. Deny the Lord or we're going to kill you. We're going to put you into prison. That's how radical it was. In fact, when he uses that phrase, exceedingly enraged, 
That means to be transformed by your anger and become a maniac. That was Saul. Angry to the point of a maniacal violence. But here's what he discovered. When he was on his mission to go and hunt down Christians, Saul of Tarsus discovered that he was actually the one that was being hunted by Jesus. Let's look at number two. Turn back to Acts chapter 9. Saul pursued. Acts chapter 9. Find your way to verse 3. Acts chapter 9 verse 3. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. And then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Pause there and give me your attention. You know, we often talk about our coming to Christ, and that often is the, uh, the perspective from our point of view, that somewhere along the line, we made a decision to follow Jesus. But always from heaven's point of view, it always starts with God pursuing you. God seeking after you. I mean, go back to the very beginning in the garden when Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit and suddenly they realized they were naked, they were ashamed, they're hiding themselves. And what do we read next? God comes into the garden going, Adam, where are you? What's he doing? He's pursuing his son who has sinned. He's pursuing this man and this woman that he has a heart for. He's coming and pursuing after them. And that's really the point of the entire gospel that we're going to celebrate today as we partake of communion is that, that God sent his son Jesus because he loved us and wanted to rescue us. He sent his son Jesus to come to this earth to die on the cross for our sins. And Jesus willingly left and came because he was coming on a rescue mission. And here in Acts chapter 9, we find that Jesus was pursuing Saul, even though Saul was his worst enemy. And I want you to think back over the course of your life for just a moment and think about how many times God made it very clear to you that he was pursuing you, that he was coming after you. All those little signs, all those little things, all those little moments where something happened and to just get your attention. And that was God pursuing you. C.S. Lewis, on the night that he got saved, said this, I was the most reluctant convert in all of England. I heard the feet of the one who pursued me and nowhere, had nowhere else to run than there in my dorm room of my university. I fell on my knees and surrendered to him there. Jesus pursuing C.S. Lewis. And Lewis was a cynic. He was a critic of Christianity, but Jesus was pursuing him. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ or you're watching online and you don't know the Lord, he's pursuing you. That's why you're here. It's because he loves you and he desires a relationship with you. So he has been pursuing you. Jesus is pursuing Saul of Tarsus, and this reminds us of a wonderful truth. And, it, and it's this, that your past doesn't disqualify you from the love and the grace of God. Isn't that awesome? I mean, talk about a, a, a crazy guy to get saved. Your past does not disqualify you from the love and grace of God. Jesus came to save sinners. And the greater the need for grace, the greater God's glory in bestowing it. And so never, ever forget this church, that, that the church's greatest missionary was once the greatest enemy of Jesus. How glorious is that? But I want you to notice the question that Jesus asked Saul there in verse 4. He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I want you to note that because Jesus says, he doesn't say, why are you persecuting my followers? Why are you persecuting the church? He says, why are you persecuting me? And that means to persecute his church is to persecute Jesus. To hurt and sin against the church is to sin against Jesus. It means that Jesus does not see his church as an it or as a building, but he sees it as me. It's me. It's my body. He has so united himself to his church that they are one and the same. And it's important that we recognize that, that there is no separation between the love for Jesus and his commitment 
to his church. Jesus calls his church his bride. And listen, you can't love Jesus and hate his bride. You can't do that. I mean, that, that would be like you coming to me and saying, hey, Pastor Rob, we think that you are great. We want to invite you over for dinner. But here's the thing. We can't stand Denise, and so she's not welcome. <laughs> How do you think that's going to fly, right? You know? I mean, really, that, that's, that's the idea here. And I say this because I meet people all the time who say, I love Jesus, but, but I just I don't like the church. I love Jesus, but, I, but I'm, not, I'm not into the church. I don't go to a church. Listen to me, friends. Jesus knows that his church isn't perfect, but he loves his church. The church is his bride. But Pastor Rob, I, I've been hurt by the church. Guess what? So has Jesus. And he still loves his church. But Pastor Rob, I've been embarrassed by the church. So has Jesus. But he still loves his church. He's still committed to his church. And get this, friends. Jesus has chosen to identify himself to broken people like you and me. And the Bible says that he is not ashamed to call you his brothers and sisters. How glorious is that? Because we're sometimes afraid to, ashamed to own each other, right? You know, like, is, is that, does that guy go to your church? Um, no, he doesn't. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> See, he's not ashamed to call you his, his brothers and sisters to say, this is my bride. Look how beautiful she is. That's how he sees the church. And Jesus doesn't separate himself from his bride, and neither should we. So Jesus says to Saul of Tarsus, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Look at verse five. And he said, who, who are you, Lord? And then the Lord said, I am Jesus, so clear, whom you are persecuting. I want you to note this. The name of Jesus was very familiar to Saul of Tarsus. He was familiar with it. Didn't believe in it. He hated it. He was out to totally exterminate the name of Jesus from all of humanity. He was familiar with the name, but he hated the name. He wanted to get people to blaspheme the name of Jesus. He wanted to eliminate the memory of mankind from the name of Jesus. He wanted to eliminate that memory from all around the world. And the name of Jesus was the last thing that he ever expected to hear coming out of heaven. It was the last thing he ever expected to hear coming from this bright light there on the road to Damascus. But on that day, everything changed. He, 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 all he, he looked at Jesus as he was dead. I don't believe him. He's dead. He, he died on a cross. He was buried in a grave. He's dead. But on this day, everything changes. And he says, who are you, Lord? And then the Lord says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And then get this phrase, it, isn't it hard for you to kick against the goads? Now, a goad was a sharp stick that they would use to poke the oxen to get it going. But sometimes the oxen would kick against it, like, don't do that to me. And this is what Jesus is saying. You're, you're kicking against the goad. What was the goad that Saul of Tarsus was kicking against? I, I think it was this. I think it was Stephen's sermon there in Acts chapter 6, or Acts chapter 7. It was Stephen's prayer as they're stoning him, Lord, forgive them, just like Jesus, it was Stephen's countenance as he starts to, to shine bright like the sun. And I think that that sermon, that prayer, that, that vision of, of Stephen just is etched in him. And he's recognizing like that was amazing. That was radical, but, but I don't believe in Jesus. And it was, he was kicking, resisting it. I love the way the Amplified Version puts verse 5. It says this, it is dangerous and it will turn out badly for you to keep kicking, to offer vain and perilous resistance against the goad. And I just want to say to you, if you, you have been kicking against the goad in your life, it is a painful resistance that will turn out badly for you. 
if you keep kicking against the love of God. If you keep kicking against the conviction of the Holy Spirit in your heart today, stop resisting him and surrender to him. I also want to give a note here for those of you who are witnessing to people and you find that you're finding a resistance. I want you to note that Jesus was pursuing Saul for quite some time. And when he gets saved, he is actually at his hardest point. He is in a maniacal rage against Jesus, but this is going to be his breaking point here. And it's been said that when you throw a rock into a pack of dogs, and I hope none of you ever do that, but if you throw a rock into a pack of dogs, the one that gets hit is the one that will bark the loudest. And oftentimes, when you're sharing with a group of people and the one who's resisting the most, he's the one that's being convicted the greatest. That's why he's barking so loudly. So notice verse six. So he said, trembling and astonished, Lord, what do you want me to do? And then the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. And then Saul arose from the ground. And when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. He was blind, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight and neither ate nor drink, drank. I think it's interesting that Saul was blinded physically because his physical blindness was really symbolic of his spiritual blindness. You know, some people are blind today because of their sin. The Bible tells us that that's what sin does. It it blinds us, it deceives us. And the deception that it creates in a person's life is they think that if I indulge my flesh, if I'm living to satisfy myself, that that's really what's gonna make me happy. And sin, the Bible says, is pleasurable for a season. Someone said, if you're not having fun sinning, you're not doing it right. And uh, I think there's some truth to that. The Bible says it is pleasurable for a season. It's true. But the end of it is death. And that's what happens is we're blinded in sin because we think, oh, this is going to satisfy me. This is going to make me happy. This is going to fulfill me. And it does for a moment, but it doesn't last. So then we're deceived in thinking, well, maybe I just need to do more of that, or maybe it's something else. So a lot of people are blinded by sin, but you know what? There's other people who are blinded by their religion. That was Saul of Tarsus. And the blindness of religion is that which says, you know, if I just can do enough, if I can just be religious enough or just be good enough, and this is the deception that it it creates, is that if you're performing well, it wells up within you a sense of pride and a sense of, of, you know, well, I'm better than, than those guys, But if you're not doing well, the deception is is that you start to feel condemnation. You think God is mad at you, doesn't want to have anything to do with you. So then you start, here's the next layer of that deception. You start thinking, well, I'm better than that person. I'm better than them. You start comparing yourself with someone else. And, And the thing is, is you can always find somebody doing worse than you, right? And so that's the deception in thinking that Well, if I just can perform enough. But you know what? It's been said that when a man comes to the end of himself, he comes to the beginning of God. And on this day, on the road to Damascus, Saul of Tarsus comes to the end of himself. And this leads us to point number three, Saul surrendered. And there's really three things that marked Saul's surrendered life. The first we see is the question he asked in verse five when he says, who are you, Lord? Who, who, who are, who's talking to me right now? And that question became Paul's, or he becomes Paul, his passion. For the rest of his life is, who are you? Who are you? Paul would write, get this, in Philippians chapter 3, after walking with Jesus and serving Jesus for 30 years, In Philippians chapter three, he would write this. I lay aside everything. I've laid aside everything. I continue to lay aside everything for this purpose. This is my passion that I might know Jesus, that I might know him in the fellowship of his suffering, that I might know him in the power of his resurrection, 
But I'm laying aside everything because I want to know Jesus more. And I think after 30 years of the life of the great apostle Paul, I think that we would ask if he was here, Paul, it's been 30 years. Don't you know Jesus by now? I know how he would respond. Yes, I do. But there's so much more of him to know. That became his passion. I want to know you, Lord. And it's interesting because his whole outlook would change. His sense of entitlement in his religion would become a sense of wonder. Blown away that Jesus would save him. That Jesus would call him. And I was reminded this week of that slave trader, John Newton, after coming to Christ... Newton's eyes were open to how evil the slave trade was. And he, he said this. It should be on the screen. He says, there is no commerce so iniquitous, so cruel, so oppressive as African slave trade of which I was involved. The slave trade was always unjustifiable, but in attention inattention and personal interest prevented me for a time from perceiving the evil. But now I am bound and conscious to take shame to myself by public confession, which however sincere comes too late to prevent or repair the misery and the mischief to which I have formerly been an accessory. I hope it will always be a subject of humiliating reflection to me that I will never get over the scandal of grace that was expended, extended toward me. And Newton would end up writing that incredible hymn that we sing sometimes, Amazing Grace. And you know that line, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a what? A wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. You know what's interesting about that? In some Christian church hymnals, though, they change the words a wretch like me to saved and strengthened me or saved and set me free. And if you do a little research, you'll find that that was changed because some churches didn't like the concept of being called wretches <laughs> because that was too humiliating. But guys, I have news for you. The Bible teaches us that we are all wretches. We're all spiritually doomed and dead. And it's not that we needed to be strengthened and improved. We needed to be saved and cleansed. And that's what Jesus did for us. Conversion is a dual realization that I am worse than I ever dreamed and God is more gracious than I ever hoped. And I love that. Saul of Tarsus would come to that realization pretty quickly. He would call himself, I'm the chief of sinners. I'm the worst there ever was because he was blown away by the grace of God. Bible teacher and commentator D. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, the ultimate sign of our spirituality is our amazement at the grace of God. I want you to catch this. Saul of Tarsus might have started out that day with the question, who, who are you, Lord? Like, who is it that is talking to me? But he went on to be, who are you, Lord? Like, you just keep blowing my mind. You just keep amazing me at how incredible you are. And so I'm going to make it my life's passion to pursue you, to know you, and to tell as many people about you as I possibly can. The second mark of Paul's surrender is found there in verse 6 in the phrase, what do you want me to do? So he goes from, who are you, Lord? That was his passion to, what do you want me to do? That was his pursuit. That was the thing that he pursued the rest of his life. His desire, it's re it really revealed his desire to conform his heart to the will of God. And it's interesting that Saul of Tarsus would change his name to Paul. And you know what the name Paul means? It means small. It means small. Saul was a very strong and mighty name in Jewish culture because Saul was the first and mighty king of the people of Israel. So his parents named him Saul. You're going to be great. He changes his name to Paul, meaning small. 
Saul the mighty is now kneeling before Jesus. Saul, the one who seized others, is now seized himself by the Lord Jesus Christ. Saul, the hammer who broke others down, is now himself being broken on the anvil of Jesus' love and grace. And Saul would discover that this pursuit of wanting to know God and to know what he had for him was an ongoing revelation. Again, he would write in the book of Philippians, 30 years after following Jesus, he would write, and and I'm still trying to discover the reason why Jesus apprehended me. Why did he save me on that road? Because this is what he discovered. Listen close, this is important. He discovered that it was an ongoing revelation. Every new city, every new encounter, every new person, Every new opportunity, every new prison that he would find himself in was the the revelation of the mystery of why Jesus had apprehended him. And the same thing is true for all of us, church. As you go through life this week and you have an encounter, God brings somebody into your life that he wants you to share with or to love on. That is the Lord revealing, this is why I saved you. This is why I apprehended you, because I I made you, I called you, not just so you can be in heaven with me, but I called you so that you can be a part of me. You can be a part of my plan and my kingdom. The third mark of Saul being surrendered was his immediate obedience. Notice in verse 6, the Lord says, arise and go into the city. And in verse 8, it says that then Saul arose and went. And this was something that marked his life for the rest of his life. When Jesus said, go, Saul went. And these three things that were the marks of his surrender would be the three prominent characteristics of his life. His desire to know who Jesus was, his desire to know why Jesus apprehended him, what he wanted him to do, and his willingness to obey immediately when Jesus said, arise and go. And those are three, listen church, those are three marks of a, that lead to a radically fruitful life. Let's pick it up in verse 10. We're going to bring this to a close. It says, Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. I love that. So simple. Ananias, yeah, Lord. Yeah, he knows. So the Lord said to him, Rise and go and to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of, a, of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. And then Ananias answered and said, Lord, I've heard uh, from many about this man and how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. So Ananias at this point is saying, Lord, are you, are you sure? <laughs> He's like, good one, Jesus. He's like, are you sure? Do you have the right Saul? You have the right guy here? And I want you to think about this because this would be, just to put this in context for us, let's say right after 9-11, a few months after 9-11, the Lord says to you one day, hey, I want you to go down to Bringle Terrace Park and you're going to see a guy there in a turban, robe, Long beard, ZZ Top, you know, kind of beard. And his name's Osama bin Laden. And I want you to go invite him to his house, your house, because I've got, you know, something I want to do with this guy. You'd be like, yeah, right, Lord. (laughs) Tell that to Pastor Rob, you know? I mean, I mean, like, seriously, right? Like, that's the idea. Like, I, I don't know, this guy's a maniac. But I want you to notice this. God doesn't rebuke Ananias. He recognizes and understands his apprehension. So verse 15 says, But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before kings, before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And I think think when when Ananias hears that, he's like, Oh, he's going to suffer. Okay, I'll go. You know? (laughs) And Ananias went on his way and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, 
the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales and he received his sight at once and arose and was baptized. And so when he had received food and was strengthened, then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. And I want to very quickly just note five things here. We come to point number four of Saul's transformation. I'm going to go through these quickly. First thing we see in verse 11 is, behold, he's praying. So he goes from persecuting to praying. He goes from one being wanting to destroy Jesus to now talking to Jesus. He's moved from religion to relationship, and that's what God wants. The second mark is he receives a new mission and calling. In verse 15, the the Lord says that he is a chosen vessel to me to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. And Saul of Tarsus was a unique vessel because in order to reach Jews, Gentiles, and kings, God needed a Jew who was wonderfully steeped in the Old Testament scriptures, but he also needed somebody who was very familiar with the Greek culture. And he found both of those in Saul of Tarsus because Saul was raised there in Tarsus. He was exposed to the Greek culture, but he was trained in Judaism to be a Pharisee. And he not only knew the Jewish culture and was well-trained in the scripture, he also was very well-trained in the Greek culture as well. And God also needed someone with that expertise but someone who was also a Roman citizen so he could move freely throughout the whole Roman empire and God got the whole package in Saul of Tarsus. The third mark of his transformation is Saul got a new family. Notice in verse 17, Ananias calls him brother Saul. And I point this out because it's interesting. If you know anything about Saul of Tarsus' life, after coming to Christ, he loses all of his friends He loses his family. His wife abandons him, all because he became a Christian. But what Saul gained, he gained a new family in the body of Christ. And as you read his writings, you come to understand that, man, he had such a love in his heart for the body of Christ, for the church, for the bride of Christ. He speaks of the bride in such high esteem. And you know what, maybe you are in your situation and you don't have much of a family or you didn't have a good family, you know, background. Get this, man, you gain a family when you come into the church. It's a dysfunctional family, I mean, because we're all broken, but it's the best dysfunctional family around, all right? And God brings you into that. The fourth mark of Saul's transformation is that he's baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's what it means in verse 17 when it says that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the word that is used is in the book of Acts. We've seen it over and over again. They were filled with the Spirit. Speaking of, they were baptized. They were empowered. And why this is significant is because Paul would go from being this man who was his whole energy and it was fueled by his own passions and his own heart and his own you know, ingenuity. And he would become a man who was empowered by God and Jesus' power and Jesus' strength and the power of the Holy Spirit spirit and the grace of God. And the fifth and final mark of his transformation we see in verse 18 is that he was baptized. And this is so radical because people would get baptized, Gentiles would, to convert to Judaism. And so this is a big deal for him to get baptized, meaning that he was going public and on record that he was now identifying himself with Jesus. The man who saw it, made it his mission to exterminate Christianity is now going on record and saying, I'm a follower of Christ. How amazing is that? I want to close this morning by just saying a couple things to those of you who are followers of Jesus. And then just one thing real quick to those here today, maybe whom God is drawing you. To himself. And then we're going to partake of communion together. But for those of you who are followers of Jesus, I want to ask you this question Have you lost the wonder of the grace of God? Have you lost the wonder how gracious, how loving God is? Have you quit asking, Who are you, Lord? 
I'm just amazed by you. Has the hunger to get to know Jesus, has that dwindled in your life? Have you lost the wonder of God's grace in the sense that that it's led you to stop praying for someone because you thought they'll never get saved? Listen, if Jesus can save Saul of Tarsus, he can save anyone. And I want to encourage you to start praying again for whoever those people are in your life, to start praying like you really believe that. Because Jesus died for everyone and he can save anyone who puts their faith in him. The second thing I want to say to those of you that are followers of Jesus is, when's the last time you asked the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to do? Lord, show me why you apprehended me. Lord, what do you want me to do? Or when's the last time Jesus told you what he wanted you to do and and you just haven't done it? Can I encourage you to follow through, to obey is there someone, somewhere that, that Jesus wants you to go, someone that he wants you to talk to, is something in your life that, that he's been telling you needs to change? As we come to communion today, it's our chance to be amazed again that Jesus came to save wretches like us. As we come to communion today, it's our opportunity to say, Lord, who are you? There is no one like you. As we come to communion today, it is our way of publicly even saying, Lord, you told me to deny myself and pick up my cross so I can follow after you. Lord, that I'm, I'm identifying right now and partaking of communion. That's my heart. And I want to do that. The cross and communion is a symbol of our yielded and surrendered life. Now I want to speak to those who are here today that Jesus is drawing you maybe for the first time. Maybe you've had questions about who is God. Maybe you've been sure, are you right with God? Maybe you have a doubt, if I died today, would I go to heaven? Would I be accepted by him? Those questions can be answered today because you're here today because Jesus loves you and he has been pursuing you because he wants to draw you to himself. He wants to lift the blinders of the sin that has been blinding you. He wants to lift the blinders of the religious pursuits that have been been blinding you. And he wants today for you to enter into a relationship with him. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you right now in the name of your son, Jesus, the risen one. We thank you, Lord, that you have died for us, that you rose again to give us life. And Lord, I pray for anybody here in this room right now or anybody watching online who doesn't have that relationship with you, maybe has walked away from you, but under, is understanding right now, like, like the Holy Spirit is that goad that is just poking their heart right now, that you've been pursuing them because you love them and you want to do a work in them. And Lord, I pray today that right now in this moment they would open up their heart to you, that they would turn from their sin or turn from their religion and they would open their heart to Jesus right now. And if that's you, I want you just in the quietness of your heart to just repeat this prayer after me and mean it with your whole heart. Just say, dear Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner. I confess that I've been kicking against you and your love and your voice. But today I want to surrender. I want to surrender my heart. I want to ask you to forgive me of my sins. I want you to cleanse me. I want to have a relationship with you. I want to know who you are and why you saved me. And so I give you my heart today fully and completely. Thank you, Lord.